Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Morning. Can you all sit me? Hi, Bell. Good morning, Elizabeth. Thank you for joining. We are hearing you and we can see you. Great, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon for those in other time zones. I would like to welcome you on behalf of uh, UN Women, the European Union, uh, Alice and uh, Black Girls Venture. Uh, we have come together to organize this webinar on Women Business Owners Guide to Accessing Capital. So I'd like to welcome you all um, today. And um, I would, I'm just here to say a quick hello and then hand over to uh, Tim Rivera, the EU delegation. But before I do so, um, I would like to um, run a through polls with you. Um, if you want to run the. Uh, so, my name is Anna Felt. I'm the manager of the We Empower program uh, that we are um, managing and uh, implementing in collaboration with the European Union and ILO. And today we are hosting uh, this webinar in collaboration with Alice and uh, Black Girl Ventures. Um, you will see we have uh, an exciting group of speakers lined up. Uh, I will give the opportunity to our moderator to introduce them uh, later. Um, and just for you to know, there is uh, a question uh, box where you can put your questions or you can raise your hand if you would like to um, speak in, in the webinar. Um, so let me just quickly go through the, the different questions that would help us understand who is today in the audience. Um, we would like to know, for example, where you're from, what country are you from? Um, since our project is focusing specifically on uh, the G7 countries and the European Union, um, you will see the questions. We have Canada, US, um, other G7 countries such as France, Germany, Italy, and the UK, other uh, EU country, or any else anywhere else in the world. So we have um, about a 50% uh, voting rate. Um, before I close, I'll give you a few more second, seconds to respond.
Okay, we have a 75% um, voting rate, so I'm closing it here. Uh, and we see that we have actually a majority of people outside the EU, uh, but also a large presence in other G7 countries and then in the US. Um, we'd also like to know, um, are you a woman? Or do you identify as a woman, man, or other? Um, it's always good to have uh, men in the audience as well. Um, we have a 75% voting rate, and I see that we have 99% women today. So um, I see that the topic is um, primarily of interest to, to women. Um, uh, I will do, uh, we would like to know also in what sector are you? Um, so are you from academia, university, government, business, private sector? media, civil society. I'll wait till we reach uh, about 25, 25, uh, 75% again. <clears throat> Thanks for being so quick. Uh, we are almost coming up to 75% uh, before I close. Um, So I see there's um, a, a, a range of different um, representation here, uh, but we do see the majority uh, being from the private sector, 65%, uh, with about 30% from civil society, but also from media, government, and academia. So welcome to all of you. Um, and one final question um, is to know a little bit more on how informed are you about um, the, the policies. Okay, it seems um, that we have a group of very curious people uh, that like to know much more about this area that we are addressing today through this webinar. Uh, we have about 50-50% about non-informed and somewhat informed and, and quite few that are already informed. So um, our uh, moderator and the panelists today, um, I think that's good for you to know um, that there's a very curious group here that would really love to hear from you. So uh, with that, I'm going to hand over to Tim uh, Rivera from the EU delegation to uh, give some opening remarks. Over to you, Tim. Great. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, it's uh, wonderful to be here with all of you today, and thank you for taking the time to uh, participate in this webinar. Uh, as Anna said, I'm a programs officer with the European Union. My name is Tim Rivera. Um, as you can tell, this webinar is part of the We Empower Initiative, which is an EU-funded project which UN Women is implementing together with uh, the ILO, the International Labor Organization. Uh, and we are working to support women's economic empowerment uh, in G7 countries, the US, Canada, Japan, and of course, the European Union. Um, this webinar really sits squarely at the heart of the project's priorities here in the United States, which are women's entrepreneurship, gender lens investing, and also the future of work. Increasing women's access to capital to support them in starting or growing their own business is absolutely key to achieving equality for women in the private sector. And there is really much to be done on both sides of the Atlantic on this issue. Um, in the European Union, women are only 30% of startup entrepreneurs or startup founders, and only 20% of businesses started with venture capital belong to female entrepreneurs. So there's still a great deal of progress to be made on this issue, even within the European Union. And these statistics, among others, have spurred the EU to take action in three different ways uh, that I'd like to speak to you about very briefly this morning. Firstly, the EU is promoting women's entrepreneurship through dedicated programs uh, and by improving investment readiness. One example of this is under the auspices of the EU's Horizon 2020 research program, we established a four-year research, innovation, and staff exchange initiative to train uh, early-stage women entrepreneurs. 
Secondly, the EU has created a number of different platforms and tools that are purely dedicated to the promotion of women's entrepreneurship. To increase the number of women angel investors in Europe, we developed the European Women Business Angels Community. It networks women angels uh, investors and it directs them to investment opportunities led by women entrepreneurs. Those entrepreneurs can significantly grow their businesses as a result of these relationships. And finally, the EU has awards to recognize women that have brought game-changing innovations to market and to honor the outstanding achievements of female entrepreneurs running innovative companies in the European Union. The EU prize for women innovators is awarded to women who have received EU research and innovation funding at some point in their careers and recently founded or co-founded a successful company based on their innovative ideas. The winner of the 2018 prize Gabriela Colucci from Italy, she founded a company called Arterra Bioscience, which is a research-based biotech company focused on the discovery and production of active compounds for industrial applications, and particularly cosmetics and agriculture. The company has developed 35 active ingredients for skincare applications, filed 14 patents, and published 23 papers in peer-reviewed journals. As a result of winning this prize, they now have 100,000 euros that they can use to further grow uh, that business. But these efforts also complement those of our 28 member states uh, across Europe who have their own individual initiatives to support women entrepreneurs and improve their access to capital. As I hope you can tell, the EU is strongly committed to, promote fem to promoting female entrepreneurship and to ensuring equal access to capital for both men and women. I really look forward to hearing from today's speakers about their own experiences and how they can form ours in Europe. I think you're going to be really, um, uh, I think it's going to be a, a great panel today. This is a, a rock star group of, uh, uh, of women working in this. But this is only just one webinar in the beginning of a series, so I hope that you'll find it useful and informative, and I'd like to invite you to join us for the next one on February 14th, which will touch upon how women entrepreneurs can prepare for the future of work. So please do pencil that date into your calendars. So with that, I'd like to take this uh, opportunity to introduce our moderator for the webinar, Sherilyn LeBall. Sherilyn is a lawyer, advocate, and strategist with almost 20 years of experience in Washington, D.C. and abroad. She was an appointee at the Small Business Administration in the U.S. government and served as, served as an assistant administrator for intergovernmental affairs as deputy chief of staff and deputy director of field operations at the agency. And in those roles, she worked with small businesses, women, minority, and veteran entrepreneurs all across the United States. Sherilyn, as well as one of our panelists, Shelley Bell, they're part of the advisory group for the We Empower project, which we're very, very pleased about. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Sherilyn. The floor is yours to moderate this amazing panel. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tim, and good morning to everyone. I apologize in advance for not being able to be on camera with you, but I'm hoping my voice will compensate for you not being able to uh, see me. This is the first part of a three-part webinar series, as Tim has already uh, mentioned, building a strong ec ecosystem for women entrepreneurs. And today, we're going to focus on uh, one of the most urgent needs for women, entrepreneur uh, women entrepreneurs, which is really access to capital. And as Tim mentioned, I have a background at the Small Business Administration, which was founded in 1953 in the United States as an independent agency to support small businesses. I always like to say I had one of the best jobs in the world because I was able to help people make their dreams come true. And the mission is still very strong at the SBA. We still support small businesses. And as the mission has evolved over the years through various programs that have been expanded, still the core the core um, mission of SBA is to really support women entrepreneurs, small businesses, veterans all across the country in 50 states and Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands and Guam. In a few minutes, you'll hear from some experts in the U.S. who are helping women business owners find and access capital. In addition, our experts are, some of our experts are entrepreneurs themselves and know firsthand how difficult it really is to find sustainable funding to grow your business and to plan for the future of your business. We're also going to hear from uh, the mayor's office right here in Washington, D.C., which is leading the charge to make D.C. 
the best place in the U.S. to be a woman entrepreneur and has already gained international recognition for their efforts. So let's go ahead and get started. And I just want to briefly introduce our panelists. First, we have Shelly Bell. Shelly is a system disruptor and business strategist who moves ideas to profit while empowering people to live more authentically. As a cultural translator, she connects entrepreneurs, investors, and corporations in order to diversify their talent pipeline, increase equity, and grow their brands. Our next expert is Sharon Carney, and she is with the um, Office of the Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development right here in Washington, D.C., and she serves as Economic Strategy Director in the Office of the Deputy Mayor, and she oversees um, the programs in the D.C.'s Economic Strategy and manages programs aimed at growing emerging sectors and improving access to capital for D.C. entrepreneurs. Finally, we have Elizabeth Gore, who is president and chairwoman of uh, Hello Alice. It's a free website. Hello Alice is a free website that helps business owners find the right path to grow, start and grow their companies. Prior to starting Hello Alice, Elizabeth was Dell Technologies Entrepreneur in Residence, where she helped grow uh, initiatives to help small and medium-sized businesses. And most importantly, for members um, on this webinar today, she's the first ever entrepreneur in residence for the UN Foundation. So I'm going to, let's let's go to Shelly Bell first. Shelly will uh, give just a few um, opening remarks and everyone will speak about one to two minutes and then we're gonna go ahead and get our webinar started with Q&A. Shelly? Hi, thank you to UN Women, EU, to ILO for having me. Um, as a part of this conversation is so important and greetings to my fellow panelists um, and all the women out there listening. I am the founder of Black Girl Ventures and we work to create access to capital for black and brown women entrepreneurs. And one of the ways we do that is a pitch competition where we include the community. Um, we work with alternative access to capital uh, with, and Elizabeth will talk about investment in a little bit um, because we're looking at other forms outside of investment and some traditional forms of capital. What else could you be doing to access the capital that you need? So one of the common uh, misconceptions, first I'll say, is when people want to start a business, they say, I need money. Well, you need money, but money is only one form of capital. There's human capital, there's social capital, there's manufacturing capital, and there's financial capital. So one of the things that we teach at Black Girl Ventures is that is to invest in machines, um, to consider lines of credit and loans, um, to consider social capital and how you are connecting with people in order to broaden your network so that you can get more, more, more access to capital. Because the money comes through connections, um, the education and the knowledge comes through who you know and who you're talking to. Um, and so we're, we're working to build connections. So with the pitch competition, is all community oriented, the community donates and the community votes. The community decides who wins the money that they have given. I believe that one, the future of inclusion means that leaders include all communities in the work that they're doing. I also believe that the future of access and capital means that we include the community before it's time for them to buy something. Now with the startup ecosystem, we have such a, a huge opportunity to get involved with each other to crowdfunding, which is also an alternative way to access capital. And women outpace men in crowdfunding by a phenomenal percentage. <laughs> so we're, we're out there, we're able to tell our stories. And when we are able to tell our stories, we are able to raise the capital that we're looking for, that we need for our businesses. Um, so when you think about manufacturer capital, uh, some another thing that people don't really teach is that when you own, I had an investor tell me that the most wealthiest person in a gold rush is the person who owns the tools. And it's so true because when you own those manufacturing, those, those machines, you can actually borrow against them because what you're doing is you're owning assets. And so when you think about the way you're able to access capital that way is you can take, you can take those assets and those assets have value. Um, and when you talk about human capital, well, when you're working to grow your business and you need talent, 
or how you work with local interns, um, how you activate the people around you and getting things done to grow your business. Business customer acquisition has to do with the amount of work that you're able to put in to grow your business through selling your product, getting your product, your branding and marketing, getting in front of more people. And that's where that human capital is particularly important. So how we activate the people around us, and then once they're active in our business or connecting us to more people, how we grow social capital, how we're using the funds that we currently have to invest in assets that will help us grow our capital later, and then how we approach financial capital from our individual money experiences. Um, sometimes your money experience through your family is a part of how you're able to act. Like, for example, women of color or underrepresented communities, women in general, some of us don't have access to a seed round or a family round. We don't have family members to go to to get, you know, fifty thousand dollars to float us during while we start a business. But not only while you're starting, while you're in business, we don't always have friends, of, excuse me, friends and family to go to for you to be able to get five thousand, ten thousand, large amounts of money to some people at a time in order to float you while you're in business. So when you think about getting access to machines, when you think about your customer acquisition strategy and how that helps you grow your, your financial capital. Pitching, pitching is telling your story and using a speaking engagement opportunity to raise money for your business. So those are some of the ways that we talk about access to capital at Black Girl Ventures. Um, like I guess I'm so excited to be a part of this and can't wait for the Q and A. Um, I'm gonna um, give some time, of course, to our awesome panelists. And I'm excited about this. This is great. Great. Thank you so much, Shelly. Sharon? Um, good morning. Uh, and thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. I am similarly enthusiastic to be a part of this discussion. Um, so I'm, I'm in the mayor's office in Washington, DC. And um, you may wonder, what does the government have to do with helping entrepreneurs um, access capital? Um, well, you know, like Shelley said, there's a lot of different forms of capital, and we really strongly believe that social capital is critical to getting to financial capital. Um, we also believe that it's really critical to have a strong ecosystem in place in order to help people build that social capital and find a lot of the existing resources that already exist um, that are sometimes just hard to uncover or, um, or access. Um, so one of the things that we've done as the mayor's office is invested in an organization called Beacon, which basically serves as the connective tissue between a lot of different organizations that are working to support women entrepreneurs in DC. Um, and we're blessed to have many different organizations. Um, Shelley's group, uh, Black Girl Ventures is one. Um, but there are co-working spaces dedicated to supporting women entrepreneurs. There are um, networks like uh, Springboard Enterprises that are organizing pitch competitions. Um, there's so many. And um, one thing that we observed after talking with women entrepreneurs is that sometimes it can be hard to connect across the different organizations that are doing fantastic work. So Beacon is really intentional about finding those uh, collaborative opportunities, um, and also channeling small infusions of capital, financial capital, um, to efforts that can really help build that ecosystem and connect women to um, the financial capital that they need. So um, part of what they rolled out when they first launched a couple years ago was a microgrant program. Um, the process for finding women doing amazing things was one of the most exciting things I've been a part of in this job. Um, we thought we knew a lot of what was happening, but when you put a call out and say, what are you working on and how could we support you, you learn so much more. Um, and so that in and of itself was valuable. Um, another thing that Beacon has been able to do is uh, sort of take a, an assessment of what's happening in our local ecosystem. Um, they put out a report uh, last year called Building Inclusive Ecosystems with Intentionality, uh, which I strongly encourage everyone to take a look at. Um, and we're just uh, thrilled to have partners um, that we can support in strengthening uh, DC as a place for female founders. Um, beyond our work to support Beacon though, um, inclusive innovation is something that DC is um, really passionate about and committed to. 
Um, and Mayor Bowser uh, is uh, one of our biggest advocates for that, uh, making DC the capital of inclusive innovation. Um, so she has uh, an advisory council focused on innovation and technology inclusion. Um, and a couple of years ago, they put out their own report um, called Pathways to Inclusion, which has informed a lot of our work to make sure that our innovation economy in DC has pathways for everyone. Um, we already rank really high in measures for women in tech, um, and our gender pay gap is much smaller than most places, but we want to be better and we want to be stronger. And so a couple of years ago, um, we launched an effort, uh, uh, sorry, we opened an incubator in partnership with a private operator called the Inclusive Innovation Incubator. And then this past fall, we partnered with an investment team to launch a fund called the Inclusive Innovation Fund. Um, and this is uh, a group of investment professionals, seasoned uh, fundraisers and portfolio managers who will be investing in DC-based companies led by people of color, by women, by people with disabilities, by LGBTQ individuals. Um, and they'll be intentionally looking to invest in those companies who are coming between that friends and family round and the Series A, where we're seeing a lot of bottlenecks. Um, so we're excited for some of these nascent efforts. I think a lot of them are first steps, but they're going to build and they're going to build on a really solid foundation of work um, that's already here and already growing. Um, and we're excited to share what we're seeing, but also um, more importantly, learn from uh, what you all are doing. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sharon. Elizabeth Gore. Good morning and howdy everybody. I'm so happy to be with you all and see great faces. Um, I'm waving at my mentor, Shelly Bell, from across the country. Um, I'm so proud to be here and tell you all that it is awesome being a female entrepreneur um, and really hard. Um, it's definitely the greatest adventure I've ever had and I'm, I'm laughing because it's 7 a.m. Um, on the West Coast and I have children banging on my door. <laughs> What me? Who are you talking to? And I, it made me think instead of hiding that from y'all, that's the reality of being um, a woman entrepreneur. Um, but, you know, raising capital specifically, I wanted to come in and, and talk to y'all because um, our company has been through several rounds of capital. And, um, you know, I've learned a lot from Shelly about the different forms of capital. So we are we're kind of an interesting company at, at Alice at HelloAlice.com because we are a broad spectrum. We we are very proud to have started with an SBA, <clears throat> what is called an SBIR, which is a non-equity investment, um, to even get our company started, which we were really proud to receive. Um, <clears throat> and then we ended up um, doing a seed round. So we raised a little over a million dollars from um, both private equity as well as high net worth individuals. And I'll tell y'all, had you asked me, um, even two years ago, is it an equal playing field? I would have said yes. If you have exactly the same books, the same company, and you walk in, you know, you're going to get chosen on your numbers. And uh, I will say that it's harder for women, um, even though that if we're given the same access to capital, uh, we tend to outperform our male counterparts. So I just wanted to put, you know, the, the real life story on the table as someone who's gone through it. Um, but that said, you know, I think that there is, the times are changing, which is really exciting. And um, if we really look at uh, investment capital, whether it's here or in the EU, um, I think that we are becoming very shrewd about how to perform and how to put our numbers first. So um, in the US and the EU, EU, there are really strong seed and angel communities um, for investing in equity-based companies, not just tech, but at all industries. And I really like to encourage folks to dig deep and not just go to the traditional uh, Silicon Valley type funders. There are all women angel funds uh, in, in both sides of the pond at this point. Um, and I'll, I'll name a bunch later, but also um, high net worth individuals in private wealth, I think is, a, is an area where women tend to really excel. So pitching to family offices who have funds under management. Um, I also like that type of funding because um, usually it brings a lot of advice and counsel with it. Uh, the individuals behind it tend to spend time with you, get really passionate about your business. 
Um, and then there are traditional venture capitalists who are the good ones and do care and can bring a lot of technical expertise. Um, but I will tell you the best experience I've had even yesterday is I, I'm a huge fan of enterprise funds. So corporate venture, uh, if you think about uh, Microsoft's M12, Salesforce Ventures, Comcast Ventures, if you are entering an industry and you know you think of who are the titans of your industry, they probably have an investment vehicle within their enterprise company. The reason I like those, um, you know, the kind of the hard facts of them is they are probably the biggest experts in your business. Um, and they want to learn from you because they're, they know that the small guys catch up in women very fast. Um, generally that capital will also come with marketing assets, uh, with partnership assets and so on. On the softer side, um, every corporate venture fund that I've ever pitched, when I look across the table, there tends to be women, there's black and brown people, there's folks from all over the world. It just is a different diverse set that I feel like is more, um, more embodies um, who all of us are. So, um, and at Alice, we're a social enterprise and our job is to help business owners launch and grow every day. Uh, the majority of the owners we support are women, which is really exciting. And um, on helloalice.com, you can search um, any type of funding mechanisms and we will help point you in the right direction, find you a mentor around it. Um, so I just encourage everyone to use that as a resource. It's a free resource, of course. And we get as granular as um, your stage of business, your physical location, um, as well as your industry. So, but also we really dig deep um, and ask you your gender, your ethnicity, are you LGBTQ, are you a, a military veteran? Because we think those are assets in your life that make you powerful. Um, and we tend to find resources based on those skills as well. So excited to be here and have the real talk. And uh, if a kid runs in here, they'll just join me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Elizabeth and Sharon and Shelly. We already have several questions in the queue, so I wanna get right to it. Our first question comes from Joan Michelson, and her question is, it would be great to hear about funding to help build a prototype. Who would like to take that first question? I, I can start. Um, okay, so great, Elizabeth. Uh, we went through this process. Uh, we are an artificial intelligence software and it's years of work prior to anyone ever seeing anything. And so I did mention that, you know, I think there's a lot of, depending what country you're in, great government funding, um, particularly um, whether you look at the EU or the US, there are departments. So we, we started with the Small Business Administration because our, our business is to help small businesses. But if you're in health, um, you could go to HHS. If you're uh, specifically in science, the National Science Foundation, and they give sometimes equity-based or non-equity-based, what I would say starter grants, uh, where you can apply with a concept um, or an idea and uh, get funding in that realm. So I think that is an interesting way Another way a lot of people don't think about, frankly, is foundations. Um, there are a lot of organizations who, even though they are 501c3s, uh, they use some of their capital to spur on innovative ideas. So again, whatever industry you're in, I really recommend you look at both uh, government grants and foundations based on that industry. Uh, and I know Shelly's gonna say some stuff that I would say, so I'll stop there. <laughs> Um, I mean, you know, this goes right back to crowdfunding. Um, I think, so the idea of business, and I work, I'm working with a lot of women across the U.S. and now beyond, actually, uh, in Bermuda and now London. Um, there is, so, I'm trying to find the best way to put it. Ultimately, the idea in business is that nobody gives you anything. And I think this is part of, part of why, um, some of the mix up happens when it comes to raising capital and, and why like, there's a, a huge pushback on some levels um, based on gender and social capital is because the, the overarching underlining thing about business is that you build something and you sell it, right? But we all know that it's not that simple that you need <laughs> in order to build something and sell it, you also need to build a thing. 
So I think that this is the place where it is about like, can you use Kickstarter, GoFundMe, you know, some of those places to use your um, if you, Facebook. There's some really good automation tools out there for putting out what you want to do, um, creating a story around it, a quick video on now your camera phone. Um, and actually, it doesn't even have to be so public. I would go as far as to create that same kind of field, feel like, you know, take your video of yourself, tell your story and do what they do in the U.S. around selling candy at work for your kids. <laughs> do what they do around where like everybody's going and saying, hey, here's this list of things that um, my kid is selling because they're doing a fundraiser for school. And then we've all, you know, well, lots of us have bought the candy that we're never going to eat just because we want to help the kid with winning the prize. And, I, and, I, and um, if we could get that way about ourselves and our products, uh, where we're able to ask even maybe the desk mate who is a complete stranger to like, hey, here's my thing that I'm going to win this prize in life, you know, self-efficacy, um, ownership. Of course, be careful with that at your job. But I mean, you know, um, those kinds of things. I think crowdfunding is super important right here. Great. Uh, Sharon, did you want to add anything very quickly or? Um, you know, I, I don't think I have uh, too much anything unique to add that hasn't already been mentioned. Um, besides, you know, just the one sort of question I would ask myself is who's invested in the solution that you can ultimately create? Um, who might have an interest in seeing that end product um, or that end approach? Um, and so, you know, finding out where you can align your motivation with others might unearth some opportunities. Good. Thank you, Sharon. Let's go on to question two. Stella Sagano would like to know, what are some of the capital opportunities that women can tap into to grow businesses? Are there global examples, are there global examples to mention which would be helpful? Anybody want to take a shot at that? I think Elizabeth named a few um, around like foundations, um, SBA or the equivalent of SBA or Business Development Association in your country. Um, pitch competitions is, is one here. Um, so there's lots of pitch competitions happening all over the place. And some of them for equity, but some a lot of them aren't. A lot of them you can apply for. You can get in there and pitch your business. Accelerators. Um, there are some accelerators that give capital, and that's also a good place if you're starting and you're looking to build something because you'll be you'll also get wrapped around you'll have services wrapped around you in an accelerator. So I would say um, accelerators, pitch competitions, um, the, the grants and foundation connections that uh, Elizabeth mentioned. Okay. Anybody want to add anything else to that? I'd act, so a couple of actual names. Um, so I, I really do like these funds that have that are growing that are by women for women, and these are these are global. So portfolio with an A portfolio. I really like um, Bumble has a new global fund uh, B U M B L E. Uh, they have a fund and they're going to actually release in March a whole nother tranche, which is really exciting. Um, Plum Alley, P-L-U-M, Plum Alley is a, a great uh, women's based funds. And, um, and then if you search um, women angel funds, that will help you find more that are in that category. But, you know, pitching in that environment, I, you know, I think you're a little bit more likely to um, be successful because um, you're pitching from women to women. I think we have a similar style of pitching. Um, so I, I think those are all really good funds. And then again, I would encourage you in your specific country to search um, to Shelly's point, the equivalent of what is your small business administration. Wonderful. Thank you. This next question is for Sharon. Sharon, our um, participant would like to know, does the DC mayor's office only support businesses in DC proper or in the DC metro area? Um, well, I guess it depends on what kind of support you're talking about. Um, you know, in general, if we have a grant program or um, any sort of um, you know, 
capital, uh, like an incentive, you would have to be located in DC to be eligible for that kind of support. Um, however, we oftentimes are pulling people together as a convener. Um, you know, there's meetups, there's uh, receptions, there's, um, you know, we organize a massive um, activation at South by Southwest. We're going out to um, the West Coast in a couple of weeks with a bunch of DC tech leaders. Um, a lot of times those things have a regional focus and uh, you certainly don't have to have residency to come and attend those things. And we think that um, it's really important to engage with entrepreneurs and investors and entrepreneurial support organizations from across our region and, our, and across our country, frankly. Wonderful, thank you. The next question is for Shelly Bell. Our participant would like to know more about social funding and how you think it should be implemented in a business that is just starting. Yeah, that's awesome. One, I just love how they use my whole name, or unless you did that, Sherilyn, either way. No, that's no, perfect. they said Shelly Bell. That's perfect. Um, so how social capital can be so Thing that, um, that I've learned over the course of doing this work is that building relationships is not as easy as it sounds. It's like, it's that idea that people tell you, like, if you're the smartest person in your network, you need a new network, but nobody trains you on how to be the dumbest person in your network. <laughs> and, I, and I don't mean that li literally, but you know what I mean? Like, they don't, they don't teach you how to stay through feeling uncomfortable, not knowing as much. They don't teach you how to stay feeling uncomfortable with not as much capital as the people around you. They don't teach you how to stay. So one of the things that I would say when it comes to building a business, that one of the, uh, and Pitbull says this at the beginning of a song, um, if you need money, ask for advice, ask for advice, get money twice. Okay. Mm -hmm. So your first step is to um, allow people into your process with their expertise. Um, and being very clear on what it is that you want and how you want it and being very direct about, you know, getting that information. You would be surprised how many times people say from a stage, if you need help, contact me, and then nobody contacts them. So when people open that door, step into it. You can, a lot of us are on panels and are having talks and conversations all the time. It's easy to get in front of us. So know what you want. And know who, again, to, to Sharon's point of like, who has interest in the thing that you're doing and just, and connect with them if you can in person. Um, and Twitter is a great place to connect with people. Uh, you know, social media, you know, if you, and, and don't, so relationship building means that you may have to have a few, have to have a few touches. So it might not be as easy as constantly um, direct messaging a person. But it could be starting off with retweeting what they're saying, following, being an active participant in the things that they're talking about, and then also giving your opinion back to them and then showing yourself as a part of your industry. So at the beginning of building social capital, I would say, you know, find the places, you know, like a beacon in your country that's amplifying the voice of what's happening or listservs that have those people on them. Um, find the leaders that you want to reach out and speak to and then start to work on what it looks like to build a relationship with people in your industry, um, ask for advice, and, and move toward a relationship where people will trust in, because a lot of this is trust, and, and introduce you, introducing you to more people. Wonderful. Thank you, Shelley. And the next question also is for you. This is coming from Nika, and Nika is a US military service disabled veteran, and she started a stationary, manufacturing company her question can you tell me when a pitch will come to atlanta i applied in october 20 2018 but didn't get so didn't get selected we will be back there october 2019 all right so we will be there uh i believe the date is october 18th you can go to bit.ly bit backslash bgv events that's B, B as in boy, IT dot L Y backslash B G V events. And you can see all the competitions that we're going to be having. You can also go to blackgirlventures.org and see them as well. Um, we're also looking at other activations that are in Atlanta. Also check into Digital Undivided. They are in Atlanta and they are an awesome um, accelerator incubator type of program with great women there. Um, there's a couple other things I know of in particular 
So feel free to contact me, like contact at blackgirlventures.org if you have particular questions that you want outside of the pitch about your pitch or getting ready for it or any of those things. But we will be back in Atlanta on October the 18th. And can I just add uh, one, thank you for your service, Rockstar. Um, but also um, the city of Atlanta has a lot of great resources. I, there's also a Bunker Labs chapter in Atlanta, which is for um, U.S. veterans and military spouses who are starting and launching businesses. So you might want to check that out. Um, I'm a huge fan of Digital Undivided as well, Shelly, so that's great. And then um, on Alice, if you register um, and cite specifically in there um, that you're a military veteran, we also mine every single resource that um, is specific to you, both in Atlanta and nationally. Uh, so you can um, take advantage of that. Right. Good. Thank you. Next question. Um, fundraising is part, uh, and this is for everyone, fundraising is part of fun, good fund research. Um, what are the sort of the suggestions that you have for yielding the best concrete results when you're doing this type of research? Oh man, I'll say that fundraising um, is a full-time job on top of your full-time job. And um, so I do tell owners when it is time to go out and seek capital to ensure that you are backing yourself up if you're able and knowing how much time it takes. And a big part of it is the research. And so I'm glad you're even asking the question. Um, you know, part of that research is knowing where not to go and, and waste your time. So even if you have warm intros um, you know, or you're accepted into a pitch competition, ensure that you look and see on the website of that organization or that event that they're specifically funding your industry and your stage of growth. That's also really important. So if, if let's just say a website says we fund series A and above and you are just getting started, that's not appropriate environment for you. You wanna really spend your time on an earlier stage. Um, I'll, I'll ask uh, Shelly to talk about pitch and Sharon on, on the government approach side, but um, really getting granular. I actually log, um, when I'm researching funds, everything on a Google Doc, because uh, one, it's easy to forget if you, I mean, I research thousands and I'm not exaggerating of funders, but then when you go out to raise capital again, it is, you might then be ready for some of the ones that you weren't ready for prior, and that will save you a lot of time in the next round. So I generally log things by, is it the appropriate industry? Is it the appropriate stage of growth? I even had a value section. Um, you know, it, are there other folks in there you can click on? What is their existing portfolio? And if I saw all white men on there, I now just keep going because I, I don't have time to be the entry point into that world. Um, so I, I think cataloging based on industry stage of growth values, uh, even location, some are very specific about geography. Um, and don't try and walk in with a great idea when you know that some of those aren't uh, appropriate. And I, I think there is an equal ability to research Sharon and Shelley on approaches to government programs as well as pitch competitions. If you all want to share. Yeah, I, uh, I would okay. add that, you know, since so great, great advice. One, two, I would um, suggest some specific resources. Um, so if you can find access to PitchBook, um, really comprehensive source of deals being done, um, including like fun profiles and interests. So all of the um, considerations that Elizabeth mentioned, um, many of them you can find in there. And, you know, that's a place where you can see um, like sort of a history of investment um, in specific geographies, in specific industries. Um, it is a, a paid program, but I'm, I know that there are a fair number of um, entrepreneurial support organizations that probably can help people find access or, you know, maybe going collaboratively on a membership. Um, there's also, you know, a lot of times in the news, you can find who's who's closing deals. Um, and so I know locally DC Inno covers this sort of stuff quite a bit. And so I think that those might be good sources to follow um, along with TechCrunch, um, especially if you're if you're in a tech or tech enabled field. Oh, and Crunchbase. I, that's a really good research. Crunchbase, I'm also following uh, PitchBook Media. 
So mm-hmm. PitchBook, some of those databases are really expensive to get into, but they but they also have just a media side where they're yeah. pumping out those constant notifications. Um, there is in the U.S. and I have it somewhere on my computer, but I don't want to. I can't pull it up at the moment. And Sharon, you may know, but there's somewhere where you can look at an entire database of all the agencies, what their budgets are, and what their budget um, items are for like the year, or what they're focused on. I think we even have that locally in DC where you can go. You can see like. I'm sorry. Say it again. For the DC budget or the federal budget? I think there's both. Well, I know there's one. What's the one for the DC budget? Good question. I should know the answer to this. Um, there is like a DC transparent budget site. Um, it might be hard to to figure out exactly where the um, like all the cycles are, but we what we have is um, a site called incentives.dc.gov, and so that is a searchable database of all of the programs available to. Um, businesses in DC and businesses is, is defined pretty broadly. Like some of them are grant programs where nonprofits can be eligible. Um, some of them are really specific to um, operating businesses doing certain things. But we've tried to create this site that's kind of easy to sift through based on your interest area. Yeah, I get, I, I'll look up the other one for the US. I have it open, but I don't want to keep switching my screens around and then get stuck. <laughs> but um, there is a, da- a place where you could look up. Um, the budgets and uh, the project focuses uh, for some of the U.S. things. Mm-hmm. Good. All right, our next question comes from Marion. She has just completed an investor debt to attract funds to help women in the workplace overcome menopause systems in the U.S. in the U.K. She's asked, do you recommend I make a short video to go with it rather than send a cover letter to potential investors? Elizabeth, that's a, that's uh, more for you. Yeah, because <laughs> I'm an LP in the portfolio and I actually like videos, but I have to admit it's still not a common practice. Um, hmm. Yeah, it, you know, most of the folks um, are still really focused on a tight pitch deck. I mean, I, I'm still surprised how important your pitch deck are um, and uh, how concise, short, focused, and there is a system to those. Um, it's one of the most searched things on HelloWellness.com is how to do the correct pitch deck because it is still the number one system on all funding, whether you're angel, whether you're government, whether you're you know, trying then if you're doing a live pitch competition. So I would really focus your time on that. And then as it relates to your cover letter, I do think there's an art and a science to cover letters um, on all things and keeping them as short as humanly possible, very personal and not formed or I don't know, form letter, not a form letter. So you're actually rewriting, not copying, pasting whoever you're sending it to. So I would really frankly focus my time and energy on the best pitch deck you could possibly build and then, you know, tweak it whenever you're sending it to different audiences, but have that good base and then um, and then and then the right cover to go with it. Y'all might have a different opinion, but it's just my most recent experience. Build relationship. So I think that what, what you know, what you're speaking to when you say that that cover letter or that entry letter or being very uh, a mix of like formal and informal, I think is, is, is speaks to where we are right now in language um, and moving uh, all the way away from what used to be the very like to whom it may concern type of distant language right mm-hmm. into this like, here's my story and you're appealing to a human being. Um, I think that but Elizabeth, you can tell me what you think about this pattern. But honestly, my thing would be to do your research, get you, you know, get down to about 150 to 100 uh, different investors or groups that you want to tackle and then figure out what your touches are. Because it, most of the time it takes several touches and it's all about timing. So whether it is uh, your first touch might be an email. Your first touch may be, you know, hey, could I ask them for some advice? Your, you know, your first touch may be you see them at an event um, and then you have a conversation and then you let them know, hey, I'm going to be sending you a thing. Or they actually say, yeah, 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 send me your cover letter. 
if that seems like a closer way to go to landing it, um, I am curious about from a cold calling standpoint, um, Elizabeth, which I think is what she's asking about. Like, mm -hmm. what is what is that can that first connection moment mean, um, and how you do that well? I mean, I'll I'll be honest, cold calls are very rarely work. Just, um, and I'm an aggressive pitch person, and you know, I would rather spend that time, you know, going Kevin Bacon uh, and finding anyone that even remotely knows anything about that organization that can introduce you um, and get that warm um, intro. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just tough. And but if you Elizabeth, are, going, uh -huh. maybe you can explain the Kevin Bacon because um, globally people may not understand that <laughs> well, phenomenon. <laughs> so there, there's this, you know, myth here that, and, and, it, and I'm sure there's the equal parts. I remember in, uh, when I was in West Africa, it was Michael Powers. Um, but uh, that one human knows everyone in some way. So, it, you know, if you put a note out to your network and say, does anybody know uh, Cape War Capital? And I might not know them, but I have another friend who knows them. So I'm going to help you by introducing you to that friend, and then that friend can, can make an introduction. It sounds so um, blase, but it's incredibly helpful. So versus going in cold. If in the small chance or the large chance that I'm wrong and you are going in cold, um, you've you have about three sentences right in two slides that folks are going to look at they're not going to go through your whole deck they're not going to even scroll down on your email so what is it that they need to hear or see or read to actually write you back um so and on that piece i'll just say do a ton of research let's just say cape or capital they're very passionate about ensuring that people of color are entering into technology I'm going to open with this is how I am helping individuals enter technology who are people of color. So answering their objective in that first one or two sentences or in that very first slide is the way I would go about it. Great. Thank you. We have um, about 10 minutes left and I want to get in as many questions. So I'm going to steer some to our panelists. This question is from Sean. Can um, any of the panelists comment about some of the emerging models for funding startups, such as revenue-based financing? Shelly, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I can. Okay. Um, there's still a lot of conversation about what is the vehicle um, for okay. underrepresented founders. And so, I mean, revenue-based funds, um, I'm noticing that there's a couple of people launching really small funds among friends and investing in what they care about. Um, and uh, I think different different uh, innovation, like what it means to innovate, people are looking at what innovation means and gearing funds toward that. There's there's lots of funds, geared, I feel like they're coming up now, get around equity. So uh, including more people, people of color, uh, people with disabilities, um, even things around like seniors. Um, I think the funding model of just the, the, the fund that does different things, that's one. Um, I'm noticing that equity crowdfunding, um, as in the U.S., the law has changed around equity crowdfunding. Therefore, there are some lots of companies um, coming up that are managing the equity crowdfunding process and allow more people to get into the um, investment game. Uh, and then, of course, traditional loans. And I'm hearing people talk more about lines of credit than ever. Like lines of credit, where it used to be this kind of like mystical thing that you only knew if you were wealthy. And now I'm hearing more people talk about what a line of credit could look like for a startup founder. So those are the three models that right. I see. Next question from Perla. Um, Elizabeth, I'm going to give this to you. Perla wants to know, what about sales? Um, how big were your sales? What role um, did sales impact your business, particularly at the early stages? Well, your best source of funding is your customers, right, is sales. I mean, that is, if you, if you can somehow bootstrap your way to uh, getting your product to the market, your software, your services, and bankroll that money, be a lean organization, and utilize sales to grow, that is by far the best source of capital, period, 
So let's just start there. Um, so it's really interesting, um, you know, particularly in, in our industry in software, you generally build before you can sell, which is, which is hard, right? Um, and that's why a lot of technology companies have to be equity backed. Um, we actually, um, because we had a, a really solid mission, or we do, excuse me, uh, that two thirds of our owners will be the most talented new majority owners. So people of color, women, veterans, and so on. Um, we ended up um, doing conferences, a lot of events, um, and doing sponsored content while we were building and actually quote, sold that space for lack of a better term, to get sponsorships to help then fund our code and everything we were building, um, in addition to then going out um, for an equity raise. So um, the other thing about sales is as you get larger or even go on in time, so it doesn't mean you have to have you know 100 employees, um, folks who are giving you loans, who are giving you lines of credit, who are giving you or investing in you with an equity base, even government grants are going to want to see that you are making progress. So uh, what are those sales? Always having those numbers um, out front. And you know, don't be intimidated by, well, I'm not, I'm not selling a million. If, if you just show growth that I went from zero and I grew 2%, then 10%, then 20%, that frankly is more important than the amount. Um, so percentage of growth, everyone talks about uh, the hockey stick that goes up is what folks are going to want to see as it relates to your sales. So uh, whether you're selling cupcakes on the corner and you went from selling one uh, to 50 a day and so on, or whether you are a software company and you think of sales and the fact that you're gaining users um, or customers, um, it's really about showing growth. Um, so whether you're, you're focusing on your sales and putting money back into the company or you're utilizing your sales to then get other forms of capital, really focus on growth. Um, and you know, if you uh, go from zero to selling one, that's 100% growth if you think about it. So it's really about um, uh, showing that upward trajectory. Wonderful. Um, Sharon, let's uh, have you answer this and then others can, can chime in. Good question here. What do you suggest for protecting your IP when partnering with corporate venture capital? Um, well, you know, we talk with a lot of companies who are um, thinking about uh, expanding into new markets, and this is uh, in, in specifically foreign markets. And so this is where um, we've encountered questions about protecting IP most frequently. Um, what I always suggest is having good counsel. Um, and, you know, not venturing into new space before you're ready. Um, so really building up your organizational infrastructure. Um, that doesn't mean in-house necessarily, but having um, people who can advise you on this um, is really important. Um, and if it means, uh, you know, making tough decisions about moving fast uh, versus moving smartly, um, I think that's, that's something to be intentional about. Shelly and Elizabeth, I'm sure you might have some comments about this. Go ahead, Shelly. It's a, it's a, you have to be careful because if you if you allow the corporations to build things for you, then they can definitely have some ownership over that. And I wouldn't even just say that's a uh, that's also with schools. And, you know, so be careful when you're going and you're like working with a class to have them build out an MVP for you. There's also IP um, lines to be clear on that on there. Um, you know, Sharon's uh, point is your best bet. I mean, have good counsel, understand IP, understand, you know, do your research and reading around, like what is actually um, that you're able to actually protect um, and what pieces of what you're doing are, are what would be considered the most valuable IP. Sometimes I've found founders um, who are spending their money on things that are not necessarily the most valuable IP yet. Um, and and then so then they don't know what to protect and the corporations might. And so, and that's not to say that any corporation is going to be predatory. Just be mindful of, of what you have that you should protect. And, and be partnership agreements, 
you know, have your agreements tight, sponsorship agreements to what any type of working with other organizations have an agreement ready, available and operating. Even if they give you one to sign, make sure you have your legal counsel look it over, make sure you look it over deeply and you also give them one to sign that that is yours. It is completely OK. Feel empowered to say, yes, I'll sign your agreement. But here's my agreement that I want signed as well. And I'll just add, we were actually at Alice, we were built alongside Dell Technology. So we did this. Um, we could not have built without them. Um, they are not, they don't have an equity stake either. So it was really about um, financial exchange, sharing ideas. Um, but uh, to Shelly's point, we actually had a really friendly lawyer and we were really friendly people. And that was a terrible combination. Oh, so we, we were advised by some of our uh, mentors to go get a really shrewd lawyer who we still have. He's been with us a long time now and he's not a shark. That sounds negative, but he is tough. And he locked us up tight. I mean, like to the point where it almost made me uncomfortable. But now that looking back, I am so grateful for that. Um, now we actually are doing product integrations with a couple of very large enterprise companies, uh, which is a huge opportunity for us. But same thing to Shelly's point, if they send an NDA, we send an NDA. If they send an MOU, we send an MOU. And the other thing is, um, I'll just mention last, which is really important, do not start work without a contract. We have made this mistake because I am such a trusting human that I'm like, <laughs> Because a lot of enterprise companies take a minimum six weeks to finish a contract. You know, we're startups, we go fast, we want to go ahead and get started. Do not do that until you have a signed piece of paper, no matter if it is your best friend sitting inside that enterprise company. I do, though, I want to stress, I think that building with enterprise can make you grow so fast in a very positive way, but absolutely protect yourself. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, it's time to wrap up. I would love for um, our panelists to just give some short parting thoughts and takeaways for our, our entrepreneurs around the world. Sharon, do you want to start? Oh, I think you're muted, Sharon. Sorry. Sharon? Hmm. There you are. I don't think we can hear you though, Sharon. Maybe I, I'll jump in while Sharon. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, so the, the biggest thing that I've learned, honestly, in raising capital is the amount of time it takes. You really have to understand this is a very big undertaking of your time. One, two is honestly, most of the time raise more than what you think you need. Women are incredibly fiscal, um, but I would always advise to give yourself a 10, 20% markup. And then last, um, if you bring money in the door, you have money in your bank account, be smart about using that to get other capital. So for um, Shelly mentioned a line of credit. I really wanted to just close with this. Get a line of credit prior to when you need it. Um, banks don't like to give you credit when you don't have any money in the bank, which is generally when you need it. So if you go out and raise capital or you get a grant or a pitch competition, get a line of credit where you have money in the bank. You might never use it, never touch it. Great. But someday you might need it and it's there for you. And generally, banks like to give you about 20% of what you have in your bank account. So when you have money, get more. <laughs> Uh, in a wise way, so you're not jumping into debt, but uh, raise more than what you got need, and then make sure you understand the, the time commitment. And Shelly. do it. Talk. Good. Shelly. Um, and the, where, the question is, what are the biggest lessons learned from raising capital? Just, just lessons learned in okay. general, takeaways for our panel, for yeah. our uh, participants. Have confidence in yourself. Figure out what you have to do to keep your uh, mental and emotional self afloat. And I, I would say I'm saying this as a human, not as a woman, not two women only, any of that. I'm saying as a person, um, I have my secure the bag playlist, which is <laughs> which is how when I'm sending out emails, 
you know, when you're on radio, they tell you to smile while you're talk, while you, while you talk. I would say smile while you type. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, put all that energy into you um, communicating and building your pitch set and so that people will, people gravitate to you as, in ways that they don't understand. Um, so, uh, and stay encouraged. I think all the tidbits we've given today are like super in depth about how to go hard. So the one thing I feel like we didn't mention yet was how do you stay sane through this process? And for me, that is tap out and be with family if you have that. Um, you know, music is a thing for me, dancing, like figuring out how you stay afloat. Because if you can't stay in the game, if you can't stay, if you're not empowered, because there are people all around you who absolutely want to give you money. I think, you know, so shape your perception around the fact that people want to give you money. You just haven't landed on on the, the person that, that, is, that makes the right fit. So, you know, go in it as if there's a, a pool of a big, you're on a treasure hunt. All right. And during this process, you have to dance a little bit. You have to laugh a little bit. You're going to cry a little bit. You're not going to understand some things, but stay, stay the course. It's worth it. The ownership and the level of freedom that you have from being an entrepreneur and also the ability to be a, a leader in your, um, in your country and to build space for other people jobs and create more equity in the world stay the course is worth it good thank you and i hope we can hear sharon now doesn't sound like it um at this time we have got some closing polls so and then it's really an opportunity for the participants to tell us um how well we've done or not done but um you should see that coming up now. We've got some closing polls and I wanna thank our panelists for all of your great advice and insight and wisdom. And again, to mention that we've our, our next upcoming webinar will be on February 14th. How can women entrepreneurs prepare for the future of work? That is gonna be very exciting. Once again, thank you to our panelists and Please stay tuned so that we can do some closing polls to see how we've done today. Thanks to everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. This has been a great discussion. And uh, this is Anna Felt again at UN Women. Um, since Sharon had some audio uh, problems, I'm just going to read her answer to one of the questions here. Uh, if you are a woman entrepreneur in DC, or interested in being in DC, let us know how we can help. Reach out to thebeacondc.com, the, so T-H-E-B-E-A-C-O-N-D-C.com, thebeacondc.com. <clears throat> and since time is up, um, I'm going to go through the final polling questions. Um, we'd like to know how satisfied are you with the discussion today. Uh, we have very satisfied, somehow satisfied, neither satisfied or dissatisfied, some somehow dissatisfied or more information is needed. Of course, we always need more information. <laughs> um, and we had, it's um, evidence by the discussion today with lots of questions. We can't learn enough about this topic. Um, but please, if you uh, find the panelists um, as great as we felt, uh, also indicate very satisfied, somehow um, satisfied. So we are um, at 60%. So uh, we have uh, the majority very satisfied. So thank you so much, uh, panelists, the moderator. Um, and we have also 12% that feels like uh, more information is needed. So let me move on to, um, we have two more questions. So after the webinar, how informed are you now about this topic? Informed, somehow informed, or not in, at all informed? Thank you everyone for being so active and, and responding to the questions. 
Um, we have, um, I think, 50-50 um, informed and somehow informed. Uh, which is a good sign. Uh, we cannot learn enough, but um, a, a great uh, number of people uh, feel that they got a lot of, out of the discussion today. So thanks again to everyone that have contributed both from participation uh, side, but also uh, in sharing your expertise. The final question is if you'd like to receive more information and stay in touch with us, um, yes and no. Excellent. We have um, almost about 100%. It's 99% of uh, people that would like to stay in touch. Uh, we will reach out to you with um, the deck today, with the recording and the resources that were promised during the discussion. Uh, so we'll share with that with you in an email. So thank you so much, everyone. Um, we are very excited. Um, of, uh, of the discussion today and the opportunities to continue to partner uh, both with the co-organizers Alice and uh, Black Girl Ventures uh, under this EU funded program but also um, with uh, all of you that have participated and indicated interest in, in continuing this conversation. So thank you so much to everyone and thank you, uh, Sherilyn, for moderating the discussion. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you to everyone. This is really a great webinar. Thank you so much. Bye-bye now. Goodbye.